Hello, gardeners. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Mid-American Gardener, and I'm Diane Nolan, your host. I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the areas of cut flowers and also do a little bit of um, working with perennials in the landscape. So that's my area, but I've got three panelists with me, and they have a diverse and very deep uh, breadth of knowledge, so you're gonna find out who's here and what they are up to. Now I'm gonna throw it over first to Dr. Jim Angel. Yes, thank you. So I'm Jim Angel. I'm the Illinois State Climatologist here at the University at the Illinois State Water Survey. So my official job is looking at uh, the weather and climate of Illinois, but I'm also a gardener too. So I uh, like to enjoy to see the interaction between the weather and, and the garden. So that's my fascination there. And we've got a show and tell today, and this is a rain gauge. And I always think of the Crocodile Dundee where he pulls out the knife and mm -hmm. says, this is a rain, this is a knife. This is the rain gauge. So this is the much bigger than what you normally would see at, at many stores, but the advantage is it has a much bigger opening, so it does a better job capturing the rain. This can also hold up to 12 inches of water. And it's good for a gardener to have a rain gauge of their own because a lot of times what happens at the airport or at the water survey or anywhere else doesn't necessarily happen in your own backyard. So it's good to, to know how much rain has fallen in your particular yard. So it's good to have your own rain gauge I like this one because it's nice and sturdy and, and big, so I can uh, mount this on a post and it does a really great job. That is a good rain gauge, wow. <laughs> and it's the biggest one I've seen, except maybe on weather shows, yes, I don't know. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, very much, appreciate it. And now on to you in the middle, Jennifer Fishburn. Hi, Jennifer Fishburn. I work for the University of Illinois Extension and I'm a horticulture educator covering Logan, Menard, and Sagamon counties. And tonight, my show and tell is barbecue rosemary. Mm. Um, rosemary is a very strong flavored herb. It is actually very fragrant. Um, and this particular one is barbecue because it, if you cut off the stems, they do get nice and straight. Um, if you were to cut one of those off, you could use that as a barbecue skewer for meat or vegetables on the grill. Um, this is a annual plant in most of Illinois, but a perennial further south of Illinois. So this is something that you could try to overwinter inside. And it's so good on meats or anything on the grill. It <laughs> is, but a little goes a long way. It's a very yeah. strong flavored herb. Yes, I remember the first time I tried it, I put it in some, um, it was actually barbecue. It was sloppy joes or something like that. And it tasted a little bit like a tomatoed forest. I had overdone it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good comment. A little goes a long way. Thank you, Jennifer. And now on to you, John Bodensteiner. I'm a Vermaine County Master Gardener and um, I like hostas, perennials, tomatoes, uh, just about anything in my yard is that I've got a little bit of it, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Tonight I brought, I've had some questions about hardy figs. We've talked about these before. This is a new one I just found. This is called the Hardy Benson Hurst Purple Fig. It is now for zone five. I have the Chicago Hardy, which I have had survive for five or six years, seven years maybe, um, but it's a zone six and I have to really protect it and mulch it. Also, so, but before we go on, Bensonhurst is Bensonhurst. B E N S E N H U R S T. And it's purple fig. Mm. Also, brought Rattlesnake Master. Um, it's a very dry, or it, it loves dry, hot, sunny places. Uh, the driest, hottest place in your yard. This is something that gets to about, oh, two and a half, three feet. You've, you've had it. Mm -hmm. Gets a nice little ball on top with little blue flowers. Very interesting. It's got little um, needles on the end that don't hurt. And, but it looks uh, but it's like very they interesting. do. Yeah, but just thought I'd, I'd show this. One of the other master gardeners gave me this about three, four years ago, and I divided some up for oh, our good. for our uh, plant sale. So good. Yeah, when I first looked at it, it looked like a yucca, but yeah. then I realized, oh, I have that in my yard. <laughs> so, but it looked uh, dangerous there, but it's it not, not at all. No. I guess I don't see it straight on. I see it looking down on it. Well, while we're waiting for some phone calls, we don't have any. We are going to talk for a little bit about the uh, live audience show. This is it. This is the last time we'll be talking about it because the seats really, really are going fast. So let's go to the promo now. 
Hi, I'm Diane Nolan, host of WILL-TV's Mid-American Gardener. On Thursday, May 28th, join us for a jam-packed afternoon of gardening fun. First, we'll hop on a bus and head over to Danville Gardens and then Country Arbor's Nursery for special demonstrations by Master Gardeners. Both nurseries will provide a discount on items you purchase that day. After that, it's back to WILL for dinner and then on to the TV studio where you'll be part of the first ever live studio audience in Mid-American Gardener history. We'll take your questions along with emails from our other viewers. After the show, stick around for dessert and conversation with me and my panel of experts. For information on how you can attend, visit will.illinois.edu slash will travel or call 217-333-7300. The Rose of Sharon is a deciduous broadleaf ornamental shrub. It blooms in late summer through fall when many other shrubs are no longer flowering. The Rose of Sharon is a member of the hibiscus genus, which includes more than 200 species. It is also the national flower of South Korea. All right, well, we're waiting for some phone calls at 217-333-3495. So 217-333-3495. All right, while we're waiting, we're gonna go back to our panelists. And Jim, I'm gonna throw it over to you first. Oh, okay. Well, I've got a, an email from somebody that has a plant growing up in their daylilies, and they've had it for a couple of years and tried to pull it out. It has a very deep root. Uh, when I saw the picture of it, I immediately recognized it. It's, it's what's called common dogbane. It's this prairie plant that's kind of on the weedy side, and the tip off to me was the opposing leaves there so you kind of have them in pairs going up there and they're a little bit on the shiny side but uh, I've seen this behind my office in the no mow zone at the university so it's pretty common it's like I said kind of weedy so it, it's while it's a prairie plant it is native it'll grow just about anywhere and it usually requires uh, you know nuclear weapons to <laughs> remove or something so uh, yeah, pulling it out is you're probably gonna have a pretty tough time. You're probably gonna have to dig out the root if you want to get rid of it, uh, because if you just cut it off, it's just gonna come right back out of the out of the root there. So uh, it's it's, a, it's a, an interesting plant, but it is a native, but kind of weedy. Okay, well that's a good and bad side right there. That's right. We do have one caller, so I'm gonna go to them and then come back you folks in a moment. Let's go to line six, and Bob has a tomato question. Perfect day to have a tomato question. Hi, Bob. Hi. Uh, what I'm wanting to know, I heard a story that you could put uh, uh, eggshells when you plant tomato plants. And uh, uh, <clears throat> what I was wanting to know is, is that right? And how much do you put each plant? Okay, Mr. Tomato, John Bodensteiner, or Jennifer, either one. <laughs> well, um, there, there might be a little bit of truth to that, but um, generally what we tell people is, you know, using all-purpose fertilizers, horse manures or cattle manure that's well-aged is, is a good. Um, the reason for the eggshell is they, there's a little, maybe a little bit of calcium there, um, but you're going to probably do a lot better, have more luck with um, using a general all-purpose fertilizer or some type of a really good aged manure in your garden. I use and it to keep the worms, the worms don't really like it in the my slugs, area, yes. the slugs yeah. don't and like it. And usually on, on, on those, if you grind them up, like if you have mortar and pestle and really make a powder out of it, it'll help. Most of the time when you need calcium, it's not because your soil doesn't have it. And, and a lot of people want the calcium because they find out that that's why they're having blossom end rot. Well, to have calcium absorbed into the plant, you have to have adequate moisture and you have to have even moisture. So at any time that tomato plant doesn't have adequate moisture, it tends to have a deficiency in that end of the tomato and and then you you're, it, it becomes susceptible to, to disease. So uh, yes, it does, you can use it, it won't hurt. If you wanna recycle, uh, it's good, but like Jennifer said, the, the other fertilizers, but the main thing is, regular watering and at a, at a good, you know, never let your tomato dry out because it's just that one <coughs> moment that, that it's needing the, the absorption of the calcium 
because uh, the calcium is dissolved in the water and so are a lot of other minerals. And if the water isn't there, it, it's going to be lacking. You're going to end yes. up with other, other things. Very good point. Um, blossom end rot is what we call a physiological disorder um, that people get on their tomatoes and then they always want to know how to treat it and they're really, it's beforehand, it's mm -hmm. um, water mm -hmm. is the key there. So. so I always, I plant and mulch almost mm -hmm. the minute I plant. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Plant and mulch. Don't if you can't do one, both, don't do either one of them. Okay, let's go on to the phone lines. And Julie has a question about butterfly bush on line one. Hi there, Ju Julie. Hi. I have a question about a butterfly bush. Last summer we put one in, and it just grew and grew. It was fascinating to watch the plants grow and be able to see as many butterflies as it attracted. Mm -hmm. But now this spring we made sure that it was all mulched in at the end of the season, and now this year, of course, we're waiting to see what happens. And I realize they don't last too many years, but this would only be its second year, and there is not one indication that this thing is coming back. Not any green. The wood still looks like it's all dried out from the winter. I just wondered if this is a lost cause or if I'm too early in the season to worry about it. Shall we tell Julie that this happens a lot? This yes, happens this happens time. a lot. <laughs> okay, who wants to talk about butterfly bush? I can. Okay. Uh, butterfly bush is, is a beautiful plant, as you mentioned, but most generally in central Illinois, it's going to die back to the ground. Um, you should have start to see some greening by now, um, but don't, don't give up hope. I, I still think there's a good possibility of it, of it coming out of it, but it'll come back from the root system. It's just the upper branches will die off, they're um, just not as cold hardy. Okay, so in my perennials class I always taught what emerges late? Butterfly bush, hardy hibiscus, uh, hardy hibiscus. Mm -hmm. balloon flowers, balloon flowers. Um, there's probably a few more but those are to the point you think they are dead and so I learned this by planting a butterfly bush too early to replace the one that hadn't come up <laughs> and then I had them two of them a foot and a half <laughs> apart so. I still have three that haven't showed I, mean, any I have issue. some that haven't showed anything. So it's Half of my hibi hardy hibiscus haven't no, shown I have nothing, anything. I have no hardy hibiscus yet. Nothing. So don't, um, don't give up. It, just wait. I guess that's the best thing. Well, and I have seen a couple emerge, but it's in very, very hot, sunny area that's getting sunlight all the time. So um, they're a little bit of a microclimate where it's heating up a lot quicker. So, and those are just newly emerged. So yeah. Okay. So there is hope, Julie. Thanks for that question. Let's go to uh, line three, and Caroline has a question about a rain gauge. Perfect. Hi, Caroline. Hello. I wanted to ask, uh, I record weather for Kokora, and I can't tell the difference between dew and rain, and uh, I would like um, Mr. Angel to speak about that and the usefulness hmm. of uh, dew on our plants. and. I'd like his essay on this, please. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for being a Cocoa Ross observer. That's one of our volunteer networks around the state, and actually it's actually nationwide now, uh, of observers. In fact, this rain gauge is, I uh, use that for that network. So what she's talking about is that sometimes you get a heavy dew, and it'll actually show up in the rain gauge and actually look like rain. And sometimes it'll be actually heavy enough that you actually can measure it in the rain gauge. Uh, but we, usually what I do is I, I look at the radar to see if there's any rain overnight uh, that, that may have uh, occurred that I didn't know about. Uh, but sometimes you can kind of tell if there's water condensation outside of the gauge or on other things. You can tell that it's probably uh, uh, dew rather than rain. So it is kind of tricky. You have to watch for that. But that's, uh, uh, and it is important in some places, probably not so much in Illinois, but other parts of the world, the accumulation of dew and on plants, they can actually use that moisture to help them grow in very dry environments. So it's, it's very important out west, but not so much here in Illinois. I get a fairly good dew collection in my rain barrels because it comes off of a oh, metal roof. Oh, that's right, yeah, so off the roof, yeah. And that's, in uh, some years, it's extremely va valuable because I don't have to carry water mm -hmm. then exactly. for my vegetable garden. I only water my vegetables with what I collect. Yeah. So, so the, there you so go. I'm That's really happy for dew. I know some people don't collect the first part of a rain or the first part of a dew from a metal roof, but there'd probably be some high-flying birds maybe would be the only issue, and that would be fertilizer. So yeah. There you go. Yeah, just don't drink the water. That's right, right exactly. <laughs> well, that was a good question. Thank you very much for that. Let's move on to line four, and Steve has a question about compost. Hi, Steve. 
Hi, uh, I've been meaning to call you for the last few years, and I've always forgotten. I was wondering, when I clean out that stuff that's in there, is, I'd love to put it in my compost pile, but I'm concerned about the uh, asphalt from the shingles, and I was wondering what you think about that. Okay, so what exactly are you concerned about, the asphalt? Well, the, the, the asphalt from the shingles will wash into the gutters, and then I... Oh, oh I see what you're saying. I, and I don't know if I should put it into the compost pile or not. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so it's the grit or whatever right. you want to call yeah. it on the, the shingles there. <sighs> it has never hurt anything in my no. garden, but um, I don't put anything on that heavily. But what is that grit? Is it just, is it a... Um, I think it's a, a silicone. A, yeah, if it's, it's silicon, like a stone-based. Uh, yeah, if it's stone-based, that isn't and really... I'm a, not yeah, even so sure they're like using it. asphalt in, in the shingles anymore. Is it, isn't it all organic? Um, they, it's they just changed. what you put it on with sometimes. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah then right. you may... You and may that's not washing off. No, no. I would I'm, say if you had any doubt and you wanted to go ahead and compost it, I just probably wouldn't use it on your edible plant material. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of a, places... Put it in a separate bin that you could then use it on your flower garden or around your shrubs um, and just not use it on your vegetables and your herbs and your edible plants would be what I would suggest. Mm -hmm. And you can't make enough compost for what you need anyway, no. so just use it on the non-edibles. Uh, by the way, I'm collecting off of a metal roof, so I hadn't thought about that. So <laughs> excellent question, thank you for that as well. Let's go uh, to George about an aloe plant on line two. Hello, George. Hello. What's your Hello. question? Hi. I've got, I've got some aloe vera plants that I had uh, grown in the house all winter. Yes. And they're really big and, big and green, and I put them outside here uh, about three days, four days ago, and uh, they're turning, look like they're dying. I just want to know what, what's the problem with them. Okay. They're, they're probably sunburning, mm -hmm. you know, going from inside to, to it, it, you need to harden them off, basically. Bring them, go take them out for an hour or two when it's cloudy, let them, you know, get accustomed to that direct sun. Even though it's cloudy, there, there's sunlight hitting it. Bring them in if it's going to be like today, uh, hot and and because they'll burn and um, you know I know aloes are supposed to be used for sunburn. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they need their own help. They 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 need a little help when it's like the, this last week where we've had such a hot sunny week. Uh, if you take them out when they've been all winter, they'll they will burn. So maybe um, hope that they haven't gotten too far. Yeah, take them back Bring in. Bring them back in. Walk, make sure they're hydrated and... Okay. Well, we're going to go back to the panelists and I think we left off with you, Jennifer. Okay. Um, we have a viewer question that they planted a cherry tomato plant every year and it's a sweet 100. And their question is, uh, last year they planted it, it got eight feet tall. Um, and normally they get tomatoes, but last year they didn't get any tomatoes on their plant. So my question, uh, Back to this viewer would be, did they have flowers on the plant that they would have maybe gotten some tomatoes? A couple things here, eight feet tall indicates to me there's a possibility that you're over fertilizing um, and over fertilizing will put a lot of uh, into the growth of the plant rather than to, into fruit production. So you might wanna watch what kind of fertilizer you're using and how much. Um, it also might be that and this wouldn't, this wouldn't explain the whole season, but when it's very hot out, um, tomatoes will drop their blossoms and they won't fruit because um, that's just one of their coping mechanisms. Um, so keep them evenly watered um, is another suggestion. And if they did actually start to get fruit, but then you didn't see them, I've heard of squirrels eating the fruits. So that could be another possibility as well. Um, and he talks about saving the seed. Saving seed is, is a good thing, but try and use those up within a, within a year or two. Okay. Lots of tomato interest already. And John, let's go to you. Okay, I have a question here from Vicki. Um, she has a rhubarb question. My husband harvested some two-year-old rhubarb this morning and the plants are full of seed stalks. So are mine. Hmm. Uh, this is the first harvest for these plants. Should he remove them, let them go, or give the plants another year to settle in? Has nothing to do with the production of, of the um, or the, the usability of the fruit itself. Um, two years old, two years is a little bit early to start harvesting a lot of rhubarb. I usually like to wait for the third year just to give the roots a chance to really get established. Um, 
if they are well established big plants go ahead and, and use it now every time I see those seed stocks so I take them off because all that energy is going into that and you're not getting the part of the fruit or the, the, the stocks that you want so uh, I'm having the same problem I've got some plants that are seven eight years old and some that are two or three year old they're all going to try to produce seed it's best to cut them off as soon as you can and um, just disregard them they're basically not edible or anything so okay Use it as a cut flower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for your questions. Let's go to line five next, and Adrian has a question about hibiscus. Hi there, Adrian. Hi. Um, I bought a, well, two hibiscus plants about three weeks ago um, and took them in and out with the weather, etc. <coughs> uh, one of them, the leaves are starting to curl and they have some uh, discoloration. I sprayed it with insecticidal soap and put it alone so whatever might be uh, would not spread, and I wondered <coughs> if anybody had any idea about what could be wrong with this. Can I ask first, are the leaves glossy or are they a matte, dull surface on both of them? We're trying to identify what kind of hibiscus you have. Are they glossy? Yeah, they are. Did she say glossy? You know they are. Okay. <laughs> All right, then go ahead and answer this question. <laughs> um, I think the, the, they were on the west side of the building, right? She is a, a mystery okay. person. Um, okay. I, I, if I remember right, I think I know who this is. Okay. And I believe that they were on the west side of the building, and we had a couple of hot days. I know. We've had some hardening off. We've done some of that, and that's just like some of the, the gentleman with the aloe. Mm -hmm. We had those hot, intense evenings where it was 88, and, and even and, and against a brick wall or cement or asphalt, it's going to radiate up, and those edges of the, plant, the, the leaves are just going to brown up, and it's, it's almost like sun scald. And... Um, I think if you just, just be patient, those leaves may fall off, but there'll be new ones coming. Just keep the plant well watered and uh, don't over fertilize them because you don't want to push out a whole bunch of new growth mm -hmm. being their new plants. And um, You know, I kind of like to harden off in shade. Yeah. Not mm -hmm. full shade, but Partial. where it's gentle, yeah. uh, gentle, getting used to it. And the reason I was asking glossy is glossy is the um, more Tropical, tropical one, and, and the dull mat is the perennial. Yeah, the perennial I don't think is up yet. So. No, I, I was surprised. Yeah, that's, yeah. So that's, been. That, I was going to say it, it has to be the, the okay. tropical ones. And uh, I've seen a lot of them. In fact, I was at a couple of the nurseries, and they were having the same problem there. Um, they have these beautiful yellow new hibiscus, mm -hmm. the tropical, and and a lot of their leaves. The edges so they were, need them in shade they, cloth. Were, Maybe put shade cloth. Yeah. Well, we're going to go to a rain barrel question on line three. Hi there, Rodney. Uh, wife and I have got a question on a rain barrels that are filled by the gutter. After a while, the water gets uh, smelling really bad. Is there anything we can put in the water that uh, will kill the smell but won't harm the uh, plant? So you're not using the water as it comes? It collects in the barrel, then the wife uses the water out of the barrel. Yeah. I tell you, you're just not using it fast you're enough. You're not using it fast enough, but that might, I put them over into five gallon buckets and go out into the area I'm using it, gallon jugs. Um, I would say maybe a couple drops of chlorine, but you don't want to put too much in because then you're going to be putting that on your plants and chlorine is yeah. the last thing you want to put on your plants. I mean, it's like, then, you're, then you may as well not collect, you may as well use city water because right. you're going to be doing the, the My same thing. My rain barrels are shaded at least yeah. part of the day. Is there any way that you can shade them? At least put, I mean, I even have it come down over in through a shade cloth so you don't get that light. But then start using them. If you don't use the water fast enough, I'd say get a smaller rain barrel and build up to when you can use it. But I do put water into other receptacles and put it in garden sheds and in the shade. And I, Right now, I'm using it a lot. <laughs> right now, I need <laughs> this more. This week, we've been using I it. I need more rain. So anyway, I don't put a thing in mine. I just am not comfortable. But So use it faster, and I don't think that's going to be a problem here soon. Well, I, 
I have to tell you, we've had a very interesting show with lots of fun questions. Our viewers are very um, knowledgeable. Well, I want to go to a, a little a special mag quiz next. What is the common name for Buxus sempervirens? A. Common box. B. European box. C. Boxwood. D. All of the above. D. All of the above. Buxus sempervirens is an evergreen shrub or small tree native to Western and Southern Europe, Northwest Africa, and Southwest Asia from southern England south to northern Morocco and east through the northern Mediterranean region to Turkey. Well, we hope you get gardening and enjoy this weather. Thank you folks for being here and have a great week gardening. <music>